Hey, welcome back from our little break there. We got a cup of coffee for the rest of the chapter, uh, which actually we've almost concluded. So changing landscape to fit the political economy. What does that mean? Uh, it's a capitalist society right, built upon private profit, very different from the native conception of communal land holding or hunting ground sharing uh, in cooperation. So Native Americans have been pushed out uh, both the farmland and uh, hunting or trapping territory. Puritan family was the center of society. It's kind of the society as microcosm means uh, miniature. Right? So society miniature was a family where the male dominated. Okay? It's a very patriarchal right? Patriarchal society. Um, again, women were seen as equal in the eyes of God, but they were not equal in the eyes of man. And there's tension there, right? There's cognitive dissonance. Like women had some rights, they could own property, but as we'll see in Massachusetts in the next chapter, Women who owned property were um, often seen as a threat to society, like the independent woman. And when the witchcraft hysteria arose in Massachusetts, single, often older, usually financially independent women will be targeted. Keep that in mind when somebody tells you how you know these Puritans wanted religious freedom. Tell that to the women and the few men they hanged as witches, who were not, you know, even participating in any type of satanic ritual. Right? They, were just, they were just seen as different, seen as a threat to a changing society. Uh, before we get to that, I mean, you also might say something about family breakdown. Family had been the bedrock of society, the high reproduction rate, um, hmm, which tells you something about the Puritans. They're having all these children. They're really not as kind of staid and maybe boring as we think they were, right? Actually, uh, <laughs> there was a whole lot of sex before marriage, but the sex was with your intended partner. And uh, Puritan families actually really controlled that. The young man would be invited over, uh, would stay with the young woman. But uh, So if the, child was, if the child came with that, they knew who the young man was. Right? They would force them. Strict Puritans, that might have been the first generation, but, but things ease up over time. Keep that in mind as well. Right? High reproduction, another factor is, look, population is going up in Massachusetts, while it's going up only in Virginia because of you know, increased immigration. Really, the mortality rate in Virginia is very high, a lot of high death in Virginia, Maryland, and kind of low death rate in Massachusetts, if I can put it that way. And a lot of it has to do with climate. The colder climate kept people healthier, right? Uh, we didn't have them, you know, there weren't the mosquitoes carrying malaria and yellow fever and, you know, other diseases um, in Massachusetts, at least, you know, not for like 11 months out of the year. And you got to keep in mind, folks, that we are in an age of global warming, right? It was actually colder in the 1600s than it is today, especially in the winters. In the winter, nothing could, you know, I shouldn't say nothing. No pathogens could live outside, right? You'd go outside, you know, you're not going to get sick. It's like living in a freezer, right? Things are actually preserved. Why do we get sick in the winter? Um, mainly because we're, we're indoors a lot, right? We're indoors and we're cramped together and our, our nasal passages dry out because of in, in, uh, in, in forced air heat, uh, low humidity, these types of things, okay? So if you could somehow live outside, you probably actually would not catch a cold, not certainly not a bacterial uh, infection, probably not viral either. But that's really a sacrifice. Who knows this year, right? With COVID, we might be teaching outside. I don't know if that's an option for JCC. But probably doing this asynchronous stuff that I'm doing right now, but uh, in the Zooming, is probably the plan for next spring. So if you're thinking ahead, like, what's next spring going to look like? It's going to look, at least for JCC, don't forward this to the administration because we don't know yet, right? It's such a fluid situation, but most likely it will be similar to what we're doing now. Probably with more flex options. I know I'm totally off topic at the moment, but this is where I went. Uh, flex means there, I teach a class that's flex, which means I have some students physically in the classroom. We're wearing masks, but I have some students in that same class who are on Zoom. Okay? So that might be modality that's uh, of interest to some of you as we try to get back to normal. Um, realizing that we never will, right? 
the new normal is going to be different than the old normal. We can't go back to the, you know, February 2020. Um, things will be different in the future. We'll probably do more of the Zooming stuff, which um, I guess is convenient. But is it as effective as being in a classroom with an instructor? you got to be really disciplined. You really have to be disciplined. When we're Zooming together, I'm not going to criticize you, but if people are nodding off, I have students laying in bed, I have students who knows if they're even there, right, to see the screen, to see their name on the screen. So, and really, to do this right, both the asynchronous stuff, that means not live streaming right now, or the live streaming Zoom takes a tremendous amount of self-discipline by students. So, that might be a skill all of us need to work on a bit, okay? It's not a skill, certainly, I had when I was 18, 19, at the age of a typical community college students. Um, I think I have it now, but that's after many, many years of, of graduate school when you really have to work autonomously. Right? When you, you're, not, you're not going to class, you're reading stuff, and you're, you, know, you might be going to class once a week and talking about the book you read for that, for that week. Right? Anyway, let's get back to the, the Puritan family. Pretty tight knit, high reproduction, um, but again, not tolerant of dissension. So we get a guy, Roger Williams, who's actually a preacher, shows up uh, in Massachusetts. Uh, no one will give him a church. He's seen as a radical dude. Why? Because he's like, government and religion should be separate, which we all buy into, but the Puritans didn't, right? For the Puritans, government and religion were, were, were one and the same. You needed to be a member of the church to go to the town meetings, right? You needed to be a member of the church really to have political representation, and you had to be a male on top of that, right? Uh, Roger Williams says... Really crazy things like uh, property has to be purchased from the Native Americans. Okay. There should be religious toleration. We should allow Quakers. We should allow Puritans. We should allow those 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 people those those people on the <laughs> on the coastal towns who are just drinking and partying all the time. Um, my God, talk about licentiousness. Okay. What do you think the wives of sailors did when the sailors were gone for months at a time, folks? Okay. In some ways, society of uh, the 1600s is not that different from our own today. Maybe our own today is actually more I don't know, conservative in some ways. So, yeah. so what happens to Roger Williams? Well, he gets kicked out of Massachusetts. He ends up establishing Rhode Island uh, as a colony in 1644, which all the Puritans kind of called Rogue's Island. Rogue, you've gone, you, you've gone against the rules island. That's where all the bad people went. Okay? Check out the map in your textbook. I know that's no way you can see that here. Uh, but, you know, where, where, where and who are they? In yellow, where's my cursor? I'm not even looking at this. In yellow, Massachusetts, uh, the colony of Plymouth, okay? um, Rhode Island, Connecticut, New Haven. So some of these New Netherlands, oh, down here, New Netherlands, these are the Dutch and the Green going uh, Long Island, Manhattan, up the Hudson River for a while to Albany, which they call I call it Fort Orange. I don't know how to say Fort in Dutch. They're going to be evicted, actually, right, by the English. Not that many Dutch there. So New Amsterdam will become New York. And Hutchinson, another dissenter. Dissenting is when you, you go against, you go against the rules. Uh, Anne Hutchinson was a very religious woman. Um, she wasn't supposed to be speaking in church, though. Okay. Um, here to insert some of those letters of St. Paul in the New Testament, well, maybe too literally, perhaps, at least in my opinion. Right? Women were not allowed to speak in church. But, so Hutchinson started to have, like, uh, meetings in her home after church, and she, you know, this is what the preacher said, and this is what he meant, and this is how to interpret it. Uh, and she began to be critical of Puritanism saying, really, you're still saying that we can earn our way to heaven, and that's not true. Arminianism. Uh, Antonomianism. I forgot some of my theological terms. Don't worry about it. Okay. Um, ultimately, she claimed that she was communicating directly with the Holy Spirit without the church in between. That always got people into trouble. Okay. Whether you were in Europe, uh, you were Catholic in doing, uh, doing that as a, as a mystic, um, or certainly the Protestants like Anne Hutchinson, that's going to get you in trouble. Anne Hutchinson is kicked out of the colony. She ends up, uh, she ends up on Long Island where she's killed in an Indian attack. All right? So again, no religious toleration among, with, with 
within the Puritan society. That's just a myth we have. Um, Puritan societies grew quickly. Again, here we get to you know, seizing land from Native Americans. The war is going to break out between the Pequot tribe and the Puritans. And the good Christian Puritans are going to wipe out the Pequots. Okay. What else can I say? Uh, they destroy the Pequot tribe. Uh, Pequots almost cease to exist. Um, and uh, the, the Puritans stole their land. So much for the Ten Commandments. So much for the founding myth of our country. Not sure we want that you know, to be our founding myth. We're wiping out uh, um, people who were part of the, that time ethnic minority. Do have a video here to kind of back up some of this with some Smithsonian uh, institution, back up on my argument that the Puritans were not tolerant of other religions. So here we go, folks. This will take us to the end. Uh, I will see you. I'm not sure when you're watching this, but certainly uh, Monday, the whatever Monday is, the 14th. I uh, will see you uh, via Zoom. Hopefully you're watching this prior to then so we can uh, move on to the next chapter. Uh, as always, feel free to email me, call me uh, if you have any questions or comments. We'll also put up a discussion board to this lecture. Please get in there and get engaged uh, so we know that you are attending. Okay. It's actually Monday the 14th. We'll, we'll get into chapter number all right, so Puritans were not tolerant. Christians were being persecuted for wanting to reform the Church of England and purify it of what they saw as corrupting elements and practices of the Catholic faith. Facing arrest and imprisonment if they stayed okay. in England, they fled to the Massachusetts coast cut. in 1630 to start their own. Oh, I can't cut and take two? No, just have to do this in the play. Yes, and uh, the way software... The way PowerPoint's set up here, I have to actually get out of PowerPoint before I can do anything else. Okay, I have great tech support here in this offline room. Alright, there we go. Exactly. There we go. Alright. The Puritans were being persecuted for wanting to reform the Church of England and purify it of what they saw as corrupting elements and practices of the Catholic faith. Facing arrest and imprisonment if they stayed in England, they fled to the Massachusetts coast in 1630 to start their own colony. The Puritans bought out Blackstone and laid claim to hundreds of more acres along the Charles River to build their new town. So, so the Puritans showed up 10 years after the Pilgrims. The place they left behind in England. Boston. But while the Puritans had come seeking religious liberty for themselves, they actively opposed others with different religious ideas. With no separation of church and state, they felt it was their right to persecute and prosecute anyone they deemed a threat to their new colony. They were even willing to put to death a young woman who disobeyed. a century after they arrived on the Massachusetts coast, the Puritans ruled Boston with an iron fist. And it was the Quakers who received most of the Puritans' wrath. The Quaker belief that one could have a direct personal relationship with God was threatening to the Puritans, and they became fearful that Quaker ideas would lead to civil unrest. Boston in 1657 to preach, she was arrested and banished from the Massachusetts Bay Colony. But after Dyer repeatedly defied the order, she was captured and brought to Boston Common. On the morning of June 1st, 1660, she was hanged from a tree that stood here, right in the middle of the common. was one of four Quakers executed because of their religious beliefs. They are known as the Boston Martyrs. Their killings mark one of the darkest periods in Boston history. But by the 1680s, strict Puritan ideas had started to fade, and
And over time, new generations of Bostonians became more accepting of other religious faiths. There we go, gang. <laughs>